was organized, everybody else sang. So. But actually, I really like it. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is printing your photos. And I just love printing my photos. So any opportunity I get to talk to people about it, which isn't very often because most people don't want to print their photos. Um, I've given this, uh, this, this uh, what, what I always find interesting is I've given this talk to, can, can they hear me okay with this? Okay. Can everybody hear Virginia? Yes. Let me know if you can hear Virginia. Oh, I'm muted. Let me know if you can hear Virginia. Can you hear me now? Okay. Okay, good. That's good. All right. So um, I've given this presentation a couple of times to Sparta Gamma Club. They have to do it. You know, that's just one of the prices they pay for having me as president. They're going to have to listen to printing your own work. And what's always interesting to me when I do it is there's always a few people that come up afterwards and they're really interested in some of the things you can do when you print your own work. So it's, uh, it's kind of fun from that perspective. The problem is, like everything, it's expensive if you're going to do it right. Um, I'm talking tonight about fine art inkjet printing. And that's, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I want all the lights up because I've got some things to show people. So oh, thanks, that, that's perfect, really. Yeah, that's perfect. Fine, um, fine art inkjet printing, the craft and um, uh, art of the fine art digital print. I, if you're interested at all in doing your own printing, I highly recommend this book. It's by uh, Jim Nicholson. I bought it. I've read lots of books on printing, but I bought this one about two years ago from b and I think you can get it on B&H, Amazon, or whatever. But it's really, really good. And it's, it's not too technical. I mean, it's technical enough, but not too technical. So I really highly, and as you can see, it's got all kinds of yellow things and markers and everything in it. Um, that's one of the best books I've ever had for normal people who want to print. You don't want to be super printers or anything like, or run your own business. But, but in his book, he mentions a couple of some of the people who print their own work. Ann Patchett is a writer, but what she said was, art stands on the shoulders of craft, which means that to get to the art, you must master the craft. And then Jim Nicholson himself says, the creation of a fine art digital print requires excellence in both craft and art, Mastery of the craft of printing is a necessity for mastering the art of printing. And, and the thing with fine art printing is it's not just about putting your prints on paper, it's how you put them on paper and what kind of effect you want to get from the viewer. And then, of course, as we all know, Ansel Adams was famous for his prints, and his, his, his comment was the negative is the score and the print is the performance. Um, <clears throat> the pr why pr print your own work? And I am going to talk about sending your prints out too, for those of you who want to do it. But I'm really focusing on printing your own work because you're in control of the process. You can do it whenever you want to do it and whenever you have time to do it. And you can make as many test prints as you want, which I can tell you really, really helps a lot. Um, I have all, I, I always do it an eight and a half by 11. Before I do a, a print for a competition, I always do an eight and a half by 11 test print. And it comes out and it looks just fine if it's good. I'm only going to have to do one big print. Never happens. I have yet to ever do just one big print. Um, it usually takes two or three before I finally get it the way I want. Um, and you can see your results right away. That's the nice thing. Once it comes out of that printer, it's there in front of you. You can also, the other benefit is if you want to order out, let's say you're ordering aluminum or just um, a, a larger print that your printer can't, print, you can do a test print before you send it to the printer. And that's going to help you in several ways. One, you're going to know that the colors are going to come out right. But also, it's going to help as far as darkness or lightness. Because I think one of the major problems that you have with, with printing is that your screen might show it lighter than your printer thinks it is. And so being able to make the two you coincide is, makes a big difference when you're sending it out to a printer also. Because they're going to have, they're going to see it the same way your printers don't see it, not your screen, because they can't see your screen. So in order to print your own work, you do, do need to have some decent equipment. 
Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the camera, not very much, because that's a whole different subject. Computer, uh, the modem, and printer, and then the types of paper you need. The camera should shoot JPEG and RAW, and there's a reason for the RAW part, too, which, would I, which I'll explain in a moment. You should produce, a, and it should produce, and you should, the camera should be able to produce a reasonably sized file. I would say five megapixels is the minimum, and you probably want 10 or more. The reason for that is the order for you to blow up, if you really want to blow a photo up, it has to have a large enough resolution so you can do that. Otherwise, it's going to fall, fall apart. A computer can be an Apple or PC, either one's fine. Um, but if you're using Photoshop or Lightroom or, or one of those uh, apps that requires a lot of memory, you probably want to get 16 or 32 gigabytes of RAM because it'll just move fast. Especially with some of the newer cameras with 40 megabyte pixels, it, it really speeds things up. So if you have, it really speeds things up if you have um, a, a reasonable amount of RAM on the computer. Now, why JPEG? Versus, as you all know, as most of you should know by now, uh, JPEGs are compressed images, and they are they are smaller than they are smaller. They're only eight bit files. Which is 256 levels of color. Now that's 256 levels of red, 256 levels of green, and 256 levels of blue. And you multiply those three together and you get about 16 million colors, which you think should be enough color. Raw files are digital negatives. They're not really images. Uh, they must be opened by a raw converter and they turn it into it turns it into an image. And they are 16-bit files. And the benefit of a 16-bit file is that you have 65,536 levels of color. And you're multiplying 65,000 times 65,000 times 65,000 red, green, and blue. And so you end up with about 280 billion color variations that you get with those two colors. And that gives you a lot more flexibility in editing your photos. It also helps prevent banding that you can get with JPEGs, which means Banding is what happens when there isn't enough data for the computer to process what you're telling it to do. And um, the higher the bit depth, the less chance of banding. And, and, um, and it, it just gives you more flexibility as far as your color stuff. A lot of activity around here. <laughs> really, really a wild place. Um, the other thing that's helpful to know, and, and this is where the difference between 8-bit and 16-bit files also help, is that um, you need to know about, a little bit about color space or color gamut. And color gamut is the range of colors that exist within a specific color space that's used by an output device, such as a screen or a printer. Printing of the printing color gamut that the printer uses is different than the digital color gamut that the screen uses. <clears throat> The printer uses CMYK, which is cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. The, the digital color spaces is RGB, and that's red, green, blue. The printer is a subtractive color space, which means if you take all the colors away, you get white. And the digital is an additive color space, which you, if you add all the colors, you get white. The most common digital color spaces are sRGB, Adobe RGB, and Profoto RGB. sRGB is the smallest. It's also the most common. It's used on the web. It's what's used on most of your computer screens. Um, it's, used, it's used just about everywhere universally. The next one up and the one that's closest to the printer is Adobe RGB, and that's the next largest color space. And then there's Profoto RGB, which Lightroom uses and now Photoshop uses. And that's, that's huge. Let me show you what these look like in a, here in a minute. The, um, the other thing you'll see when you're looking at, at, compute, at monitors is NTSC, which is the National Television Standards Committee. And the NTSC color space is 72%. Um, 72% NTSC is the same as sRGB. So the NTSC color space is larger than the sRGB color space. Now that becomes important when you're looking for monitors. That's why I mentioned it. 
So how, what are the three color spaces? The sRGB is the smallest. It's like a 24 box of crayon. And the Adobe RGB color space is larger. It's like a 64 box, uh, box of crayons. And I'll tell you, when I was a kid, I would have given anything to have a 64, a box of 64 crayons, anything. And now they have a box out that's 152 crayons. I think I would have died and gone to heaven if that had happened to me. The, this is another way to look at color spaces, and it's just sort of important that, that, that we understand the differences between these color, color gamuts. These, this is the, this, the, this funny shaped object is the visible, the, the amount of colors that we can see with our eyes. This, this triangle right in here, that's the sRGB color space. Those are the colors that are in the sRGB color space. These are the colors that are in the Adobe RGB color space. You can see there's a few more greens, a few more reds, not too many more blues or purples. And this is Profoto RGB, and Profoto RGB is so big that there's colors in it that we can't see, that are sort of imaginary. And this is how they look together. So when you're buying a monitor or display, it's important to understand the differences between, because if you between these three color spaces. Because if you're really serious about printing your own work, it really helps to have a, a monitor that'll give you the broadest color space possible within your budget. So the monitor of the display should be a good, good quality monitor with a, a wide color gamut. And there's a lot of them out there. Dell makes a good one. Uh, ben Q makes a good one. Uh, Acer makes a good, or as Acer, I think that's what it is. As we said, yeah, we both, they all make good monitors. The display should, it, it should be large enough um, so that you can see the, with the photo. Um, 24 inches is a good size. I've got a 27 inch and a 24 inch, and quite frankly, I prefer the 24 inch. 27 is big. And um, it should have IPS or in-plane switching because that gives more consistent results. Uh, laptops are normally not recommended. And I would say if you're serious about editing your photos for printing, that you probably should get a monitor and attach it to your laptop and not use your laptop monitor. Because the laptop monitors, it's hard to find that any laptop monitors that have more than an sRGB or NCFC color space. You probably, if you want, really want the broader color space, you're going to need to get um, a large uh, a monitor that has that capability. And so when you're looking at color spaces, um, as, I, as I said, sRGB is the smallest one and that has about 16.7 million colors. Adobe RGB is about 1.07 billion colors and the Profoto RGB is about 281 billion colors, trillion colors. But the thing is, you really need to focus on probably the Adobe RGB because I don't think there's a device out there that can uh, give you the Profoto RGB color space. So when you purchase a monitor, I actually went on to b and before this just to sort of get an idea of the prices. And, and they really, I thought they had gone up, but they haven't gone up that much because I bought mine two years ago. Um, for $279, you can buy a decent 16 million colors. Now that's your sRGB color set. And if all you're doing is JPEGs and that's what you're sending out, that's probably going to be fine. But if you really want to do more than that, then you probably need one that at least says 10 bit support for 1.07 billion colors. That's going to be the minimum that you probably, if you're really serious about getting good prints. The next one up that I found, and I think there's some in the range there, was Adobe RGB DCI-P3, which is an Apple color space, sRGB and uh, REC709, whatever that is. So that's telling you that, that it's, it's, it's covering those, but it doesn't tell you 100% Adobe RGB. To do that, you had to get up into the 1,159, which is 99%. So it's, it's finding a, 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 a monitor that's within your price range that has as much color as you can, can afford. It's kind of what it is. But the more you get, the better off you're going to be. Now, the other thing you need to do, and whether you have a laptop or a, a sRGB monitor or whatever, you still need to calibrate it. And if you're not calibrating your monitor, then you're really taking a risk, especially if you're sending your work out. Because calibrating the monitor makes, when you put a calibration device on, and I brought it along, 
I won't do it here because it takes time, but it's this cool little device. How many of you currently care to celebrate? Oh, that's pretty good. It's this cool little device. And um, this part. And you put you load the app onto your computer, you run run the app, and then you put this little thing in front of your monitor and it flashes a bunch of colors so that and it decides whether or not those colors are true or not. And then it um, makes adjustments to your, your computer so that the colors are showing accurately on your screen. It takes about that doesn't take that long to do it, maybe 10, 15 minutes. There's all kinds of devices out there. They usually cost 100 to probably about $100 for a decent one. Uh, X-Rite makes some, Data Color makes some, um, Calibrite Color Checker. Um, and they're not that hard to run. Uh, I won't go through it because it's, it's different for each device. But um, one of the things I've noticed about all of these, and I just watched a video about printing, and he said the same thing. He said, don't necessarily listen to what they're saying about your screen brightness. I know whenever I run it on my screens at home, they always say I need to make the screen a lot brighter. Well, every time I do that, the print comes out way too dark. So I finally learned over the years, I'm slow, I'm really slow. If they tell me to do something, I'm going to do it. Learned over the years to make my screen a lot darker than they tell me until it matches what the print, the print coming in. That way you can be assured that um, what you're looking at is the same as what your printer thinks it's seeing. And this helps for a thinning workout too. Yeah. I'm just curious when you do that and you bring the, uh, the brightness down, do you find that it's um, like comfortable to do that? Or is it just like a visual as well? Yeah, it's fine. The, the, when the, the level they wanted it at was way too bright. Okay. So it, it works really well. I've been really happy with it. The other thing, so that's, no, that's on the printer piece. The other thing is on the printer piece. So we'll get to that in a minute. But that is one tip I'd make. Don't listen to them when it make make the screen brightness match your print. That's going to be a lot easier. And once, it, even if it's your home printer, is is match. It's going to make it a lot safer when you're sending it out to the outside printer because you already know that you've got the right screen brightness. So what you're sending out is going to be probably the right brightness for them too. This is the printer I would love to have. I I don't have it. I have the next one down. Um, someday, if I ever start really printing fine art prints for sale, uh, I will buy this, but uh, it's not going to happen for a while. Um, this is a Canon, the Canon, a Canon professional printer. Uh, it has, I don't know, 12 or 12 ink, ink tanks, I think, or more. Um, and, it, and it's a 17 inch wide carriage. It's a fairly large printer, so you can print some really nice things. It's a nice printer. I would die for it. But when you're buying a printer, if you're serious about getting into this and you want to buy a printer, um, you really should be looking at the professional printers. Not, not your normal walk into Staples, spend 80 bucks and bring it home. You really want to get a professional printer. And there's two types, Canon and Epson make them. HP does too, but I don't think they're that much in the market anymore. Um, Canon makes a thermal, uh, thermal printer and Epson makes a piezoelectric printer. And I have... I put the descriptions down. Um, this is being recorded so somebody can read it if they want. But I have no idea, even, even after reading the, the descriptions, what they do. Um, so the, the two there's two types of printers. The, there isn't much difference between them, except I have heard through the grapevine, and I've heard it over and over and over again through the years, that Epson's uh, printhead tends to clog uh, more easily than Canon. So now I've had a uh, print. I've had two Canon printers in the last 12, 10 years, and I haven't had any trouble with it at all. But I've had a lot of people complain about that. So it's um, just, the, that's, I don't know if that's because of the, it tends to clog, clog, like the, the ink clogs up in the print pad and then you can't print. The Canon tends not to do that, right. It has a better reputation that way than Epson. So, I'm not sure why Epson earned that reputation, but I keep hearing it over the years, and so uh, I just pass that on. The 
size the size of the carriage. This is what mine is a 13 inch, which means I can put in a piece of paper 13 inches wide, it's 13 by 19. And I think the next one is 17, and they go up from there to get up to 60 inches. So if you want to print out really big prints, you can get a really big printer to do that. The other thing you should look for is the number of ink tanks. The more ink tanks you have, the more variety of colors you can get. Mine has, the, the lowest one is eight, mine has 10. And um, I, think, I think you can get printers with more than that. Either that or they have bigger ink tanks that, um, with the base colors in them. Uh, the professional model with, it should have, the more ink tanks, the more color variations. The other thing you need to look for, most of these professional printers use archival ink. And that means that ink is gonna stay stay on that paper for a long time without fading. And the other benefit of a professional printer, printer is that it's supported by major uh, fine art paper manufacturers. And this is a huge benefit. My first printer that had 10 ink tanks or 12 ink tanks or something, I was so excited about it. This is back in 2012, I got it, brought it home and started printing with it and then realized right away that I needed to download some pro profiles. And I'll explain that in a minute. None of the manufacturers supported that printer. Luckily for me, it died after about two years, so I could go out and get a professional printer that actually is supported by the paper manufacturers. So, and Canon and Epson are the, are the two printers that all the paper manufacturers support. These printers are expensive right now. I bought my Canon printer in 2014. It was on. It was a six hundred dollar printer. It had a two hundred dollar. It was at Union Photo during their expo. They had two hundred dollars off, and then they gave you a two hundred dollar rebate. Plus, they gave you fifty dollars worth of free paper. So it ended up uh, the net cost was about one hundred and fifty dollars. Two years ago, when I had to get another one because the first one died, I it was still six hundred dollars. They gave me two hundred dollars off plus a hundred dollars worth of paper. Now, this same printer is $900. And that's because of the pandemic and all the supply chain issues and all that. So it's probably not the greatest time to get in the market unless you really want to do this. So the reason you want professional inkjet printers is that they have two types of ink, um, dye base and pigment ink. Um, dye base, dyes the paper and it's it's good quality but pigment ink tends to have a better reputation for being for our being archival um also it tends to be more color fast than the dye base casing now i think you have to be talking about years and years and years I, the dye base is, is a good printer but that's just that's just what they say all those people that say those things um yeah do you know do you have an option of using either dye or for the same no, it's, it's either a dye base or a, a pigment thing. Yeah. The, the inks in the printer that you buy should be archival, which means they do not fade. Now, the concerns of these professional printers, and whether it's Epson or Canon, is if you don't use them regularly, they will dry out or they will clog up. So you need, if you're going to print one thing and then let it sit for six months, don't buy it because you won't be able to use it after six months. You need to use them regularly. And, and what I've done in times of periods when I'm not printing is I'll just turn it on. And if I leave it on for about 30 minutes, it sort of thinks about things for a while. And it says, well, you know, I feel like a stretch. And it sort of, you know, starts moving the print head around and, and jiggling the, print, print, the ink and everything. Just turning it on, you know, once every two weeks or once every week if you're not using it. That, that's usually enough to keep it from clogging. But you do you can't just let it sit. That's, you know, that's really hard to figure out because you've got you've got um, ten colors, ten, 10 colors, and you don't use them evenly. So it's really hard to figure out how many prints an ink tank will will print. I I if I'm printing even if I'm printing a lot, I might the my box of 10, if I buy a box of 10, I usually buy individuals, but if I buy a box of 10, that's $134. And I might, if I'm doing a lot of printing, I might buy three a year. So that's about as close as I can come. Now the new printer, my new one, it's not $134, it's $176 for the box of 10. But um, 
it depends on how much printing you're doing, how fast you go through them. I, but I can't tell you on any, any individual instance. So let's see what else did I have here. I guess most of it was with the paper. Okay. Oh, yeah. And this is the last tip that I wanted to mention with respect to printers. And this is something I just learned recently. When I bought my new printer in 2020, I couldn't get it to pair wirelessly with my router. So I connected it by USB, so I didn't want to mess with it. And I've been getting great prints, you know, since then. I didn't really think about it until I was watching a, a printing video recently. And he said, don't pair it while, don't use wireless with your professional printer. Even though they're set up to do that, he said, don't do it. He said, you won't get as good a quality print. And I have to say, I would have to say that's absolutely true because I always had trouble with my printer before when it was paired wireless. I didn't relate it to the wireless connection, but I have not had any trouble with my prints since, um, since I got this new one and, and the video station. So buy a long, if it's printer's long way from your computer, buy a long USB cable. Uh, it's not a, hard to do, but it's definitely a, gonna, a better result. Okay, so that's sort of the basis of the equipment that you need. Are there any questions at this point? So, I mean, it's kind of good to know the question. So, I don't know if you can answer this, but did you, have you ever read anything or just from your own experience? kind of figured out whether it's cheaper to print on your own in the long run or send it out or is there just too many variables? I read something recently and some guy, one of these videos, I, I watch all this stuff. Um, yeah. He said it, it takes about 60 prints to pay off the cost of the ink and the paper and all that. And I'm, I'm not sure you ever pay off the cost of the printer, yes. um, but is it cheaper? I think I think it's cheaper, but for me, the reason, I think it's a little bit cheaper. I don't think it's hugely cheaper. I mean, but the reason I do it is because I would never, ever be happy with something that was printed by somebody else. Just never. It has to be the way that I want it. So um, for me, it's my own personal satisfaction. That's why I do it. I don't think it costs me a lot more to do it, though. But of course, if I'm printing out you know, three or four, you know, these pieces of paper, the paper, the fine art paper can cost $3 a sheet. So that can add up after a while. If you, you're too much of a perfectionist and just keep, keep printing them. I wouldn't do it to save money, but at the same time, I don't think it's going to be all that much more expensive to do it. And so if you're, if you're going to do fine art printing, you're going to be concerned about what kind of paper you use. And that's, I've brought a lot of things here to show you tonight. Um, if, you're, if you buy a Canon or an Epson printer, the profiles for the Canon and Epson printers, papers are included with the, the, the printer driver when you download it. That's, they want you to use their papers, so they make it as easy for you as they possibly can. Uh, they have lots of different papers and they're perfectly good papers, and I use them all the time. Um, they're cheaper than the fine art papers and they're great for the camera club competition, they're fine. Um, they have glossy, they have semi-gloss, they have luster, they have matte. You can get a lot of different surfaces. And they may, but they may or may not be archival. So if you're, you've got a client who wants to spend $400 on a print, you probably don't want to use a Canon or Epson paper. You probably want to get something that's a little bit more, has a longer uh, life to it. Fine art papers that are um, produced by Canamule or Canson Infinity are usually archival. They're different papers for different types of pictures and um, such as rag photographic, and I'll show you some of these in a minute here. They're more expensive. They can be two to three dollars per sheet, but, they, but when you get the right picture on the right paper, I tell you, it's like, it's just so cool how it can look. It's just really, really different than your normal Canon Pro Luster paper. It's just amazing. It's really worth it. Uh, fine art printing, Papers uh, should be acid-free, which means that they're, um, the, base, the base paper fibers have a pH of seven or more. And the benefits are that the papers, papers with a neutral pH resist yellowing and deterioration over time. 
not, but not all asset-free papers are archival. Our, for a paper to be archival, it should be made out of pure cotton rag or alpha, pure alpha cellulose fibers. The best cotton rag should last for more than 100 years. And this is what, you, if you actually start selling your work, if you're going to sell your work to some client and they're going to spend two or $300, they don't want to look at it in 25 years and see it fade like your family photos do, right? They, they want it to be on their wall. They want it to be on their wall, pass it down to their grandkids or whatever, and it needs to look the same. The other thing you have to watch out for if you're buying um, uh, fine art paper is OBAs. Uh, optical brightening agents create a whiter paper, but they also are prone to yellowing and deterioration of it. And some of the some of the papers are co coated with OBAs to make them look whiter. So you have to watch out for that. If you're really buying high-end paper, that's what you have to look out for. If you're concerned about um, the paper uh, permanency, Wilhelm Imaging Research is a website. They're an independent party, and they test all these papers for permanency. So when you're selecting a paper, so you, as we've talked about, you want a paper that's, that's going to last for several years without fading. Um, the paper color is important because printers don't have white ink. So if you have really white clouds and you want to make sure they're white, you probably don't want an off-white paper. You probably want a white paper. The paper texture can make a big difference in how a photo looks. Some of them are very smooth. Some of them may have a nice texture to them. Um, the thickness of the paper helps as far as its uh, handling it goes. If they can be from 180 uh, grams per uh, gram, grams per square meter to 360 grams per square meter. The Dmax is the maximum density of the blacks on the paper. Um, a in general, the higher the Dmax, the the, the better because the DMAX is how intense the black is on the paper. Um, and that's really important if you've got black and white, things like that, or if you want a high contrast print. It's not as important if you want a low contrast print. Glossy and satin papers tend to have the highest DMAX. So I brought some papers. I brought. I, brought some fine art papers because I thought it would be cool to actually see what what uh, these look like and I'll put them out so you can take a look at them or I can pass them around. This is this was printed on platinum fiber rag. It's a Canson Infinity paper. It's a, a semi-gloss paper. Um, it's it's got a slight texture and uh, it's got a very high DMAX so you get a lot of contrast and detail. Got good tonal separation, and it provides a variation. It provides variation in tonality to increase the depth. And it's I really love it for these types of pictures, pictures with color and stuff like that. It's just it's really it's like a pro luster, but it's a much better paper. It's a little bit thicker. It's just a much better paper. So that's that one. And it says on the back what it is. The next one is a, a Beretta photography. This is a glossy paper. It's got a very high DMAX, as most glossy papers do. It's, it's good for black and white, and that's why I put it on, I put on a, a, it on a black and white paper. And this one, I love the, the rag. This, well, wait a minute here. This is for the people at home. This is the, the platinum Faber rag that I was showing everybody and the Beretta photograph. Now, you can't see the characteristics on the screen, of course, but uh, um, so I have them here so that you can actually see how the papers look. This one is the rag photography. It's 210 grams per square meter. It's uh, got a matte finish. It's no texture. There's no texture on it. It's nice and smooth. It's soft and quiet. This is, this is, this is not one you, you, you can use. A, um, it's a white paper, so you can, you can use it with, without having white ink because it looks very nice. But I like it because it's such a nice, soft, it's really good for fog uh, and, and soft, useful scenes. It's really nice for those. And then the last one is the addition etching rag, which I'm not that crazy about. And um, I used it for my butterfly photo, but I don't think that was the best choice of it. But you can see how they look on these 
um, papers. And for those of you at home, that's the rag photography with the fog, and then the addition etching rag with the butterflies. Now, I don't use the fine art papers too often for competitions, mainly because pictures get beat up in competitions. You know, they're handling them, they're throwing them around or whatever. I usually use my Canon, my Canon papers for compositions. Um, and the bridge here, I used a semi-gloss. I have that here too. Okay, the bridge I used um, a semi-gloss on because it was so smooth. You know, the water smooth, the bridge smooth, and a semi-gloss paper is a nice smooth paper. So it works really well for that. This one I used a, a pro luster on because it's it's got a lot of detail and stuff, and pro luster is kind of a great, it's got a slight grain to it, so it really enhances the detail in the photo. I hardly ever use a matte paper for competition, mainly because that soft, smooth, wonderful, peaceful look is not something that judges go nutsy about. They prefer the picture in the head head type of photos. So, so uh, the fine art, you know, foggy photos, uh, they aren't worth spending the money on the, on the matte paper. Some photos don't print well at all. And I have tried over and over again to print this photo. And I think it's going to take a lot more editing than I have time for. It just does not come out well. I don't know if I brought that one along. I'll, I'll try and find it. It just, it just does not look, look that good uh, when it prints. It's sort of, you know, you can't see the whites and the yellows don't come out really bright. So so not everything works in a print. Oh, can I ask a question? Do you think that printing something like that photo on metal would be different? Oh, yeah, probably, yeah. It probably would metal or aluminum or something like that. Yeah, it would. You probably could, could get a really great color. All right. Um, now, if you're using a uh, a paper such as such as this, it has a distinct surface and color to it, and your printer needs to know how to put the print on or ink on it. Otherwise, it's going. Otherwise, it's just going to throw its ink on it, and you could get just about anything. And the way you tell the printer to do that is by purchasing, a, or not purchasing, but downloading a paper profile from the manufacturer of the paper. And as I said earlier, Canon and Epson provide you with the profiles for their papers when you download the printer driver. But you, for the outside, like Canson Infinity and Hannah Mule, you, you have to download those profiles. <laughs> Um, I have because it's a professional printer and the paper sort of comes down from the back and comes straight through. It doesn't go around, so is that make, yeah, it would be if it's going around that would be really hard. It's not. I think it could do it, but it. it I don't think it's the optimal, right? That's a good question, actually. The profile, when you go to the paper manufacturer, the profile must be downloaded to your computer. It tells the printer how to apply the paper surface. It also tells the printer how thick that paper is. Now, I'm not sure. I've, I keep reading this, but I don't know how it can, because when you download the profile, you download the profile for rag photography. You're, there's nothing in there that tells the printer if whether it's 110 or 2, 220 or 360. And yet you can buy rag photographies in all three three sizes. So I, I, I don't, maybe, maybe it's telling it some, but I don't know how it knows. So, um, and some outside print firms provide profiles uh, to use before you, oh, that's the other thing, yeah. As when it comes to, um, Outside firms, if you're sending your prints out and you're really concerned, they will send, they, many of them will send you a profile that you can use to edit your photos. You can't use it, it doesn't help for printing, but if they send you the print profile layers, you can use it for editing your photos and proofing your photos, color proofing your photos, so that you can at least get that part of it right. And if you check your, your, your um, brightness of your screen, you should be good to go with the outside printer. So 
So I, I thought what I'd do is I can get on. I'm not sure I can. I, I show you how, how you get the profile. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure it's going to do it with Zoom running. So if you're going to download a profile, let's say you bought some paper from Canson Infinity. And um, you go to their website. And you click on ICC profiles. Now you can buy the paper at BNH, or I don't think Unique has Canson Infinity anymore. They have Hannah Muley, but you can buy the paper at a lot of stores. And you just go to the profile of the paper manufacturer. You put in their your printer model. You put in the um, the model, and then scroll down, and all their papers are listed here. And you can just select the one you want. Like that one, and then click download. And what gets downloaded is the profile and the instructions, and it'll tell you how to how to get it to connect to your app and the instructions. It's not it, see, it seems kind of scary, but it's not at all. It really works well. All right. That's downloading the profile. Now, okay, you've got the profile. You're ready, pretty much ready to go. So check the photo for artifacts, chromatic aberrations, dust bugs, other distracting elements. And you asked a question about print sharpening. If you're sending a print, I would let the printer at the place print sharpen it. I don't think I would sharpen it because you don't really know what this printer is doing. Uh, when you're um, doing your own printing, there is in the print modules, whether it's Photoshop or Lightroom or whatever app you're using, there is a print sharpening area in there. And standard print sharpening should usually work for that. So, but that has to do with your printer. So I'm not sure I would um, do any print sharpening before I send it out. So, in this picture, I did this for the fair this summer, uh, and I debated for a long time. I kept looking at it, saying, ah, is that white light a really a problem? Is it, a, is it, is it going to be distracting? And I, my, my, uh, my, my lazy self said, nah, it's gonna, not going to be a problem. The judges won't notice it. And then my inner competition self said, yes, it's going to be a problem. You better get rid of it. So I spent a couple hours trying to get rid of that stupid thing so that I could print it. And it ended up when it ended up winning best in show at the fair this year. This was a friend of mine. She sent it to me. She she said uh, I sent a a picture to the printer and um, it it came back all wrong. And I said, Well, did you calibrate your screen? Well, no, I don't calibrate my screen. Well, duh. I said, Well, send it to me and I'll, and I'll print it out for you. But when she sent it to me, it had all this junk on it, these little, uh, you know, black spots on the leaves and everything. So I cleaned the whole thing up and gave it back to her and she ended up winning an award with it. So it's no different from entering a digital competition. The, the print, ha it has, the picture has to be clean. Your print's going to show everything. So the other two things you have to do when you're getting ready to print is you need to check the rendering intent of the photo. You do this through soft grouping. And there's two types of rendering intent. Uh, let's put up lit Lightroom if you can. When you to soft proof, and I'm doing it in Lightroom, but you can also do it in Photoshop. And I put the instructions in this presentation. Um, you click on this little button right below the, the um, picture. And then it, cre it creates this, this thing. This, and what you can do is, you can, these are the two rendering intents. And perceptual, and I have to remember because I always forget. Um, perceptual is that, well, we'll start with relative. Relative preserves the colors that are in gamut. So the colors that the printer can print, it'll preserve those. But the colors that it can't print, it'll push those into, into the, the color space that it can print. So it'll assign colors to it that are close, but not the same. The perceptual 
is it takes all the colors, the ones out of gamut and the ones in gamut, and it squashes them all together so they're all in gamut, but they keep their relationship to each other the same. You can't probably notice this to any great degree when you're printing off something. But, um, but sometimes it can make a difference. Um, in this bird, if you click on perceptual, you can notice there's this is just a little bit brighter underneath here than when you click on relative. It's a little bit darker. And it's sort of your preference, how you want it to look. Not One is not better than the other. It's just how you want it to look. Sometimes, and I'm, I'll show you a picture of it. Um, you need what you need to do though when you're when you are checking this is make sure that you've downloaded that you installed the paper profile here, and you can do that. This is Lightroom, but you can do that by clicking. I don't know why it doesn't have all my profiles. You, when you click on on this area here, when you click on profile. It should give you your full list of profiles. There we go. The full list. You can see all the Canon profiles are in here. Uh, it'll give you the full list of profiles, and you can click on the one that you're using for that paper, and then um, it'll show you how that picture is going to look under these two types of rendering intent for that profile. You know, if, if you're getting um, the printer profile from an outside printer, is this where you? Did you use that here, you know? Uh, yeah, that's, this is where you would use it, is, is selecting your rendering intent and doing your editing. Because when, you're, when you've got the soft proof, you can edit the photo and save a proof copy, and then that's the one I would send to the printer. All right. Sometimes I'll show you pictures of one which was much more dramatic than this one. The next thing you have to do is select the resolution, but I'll get back to that in just a second. So soft proofing, these are in the instructions for Lightroom and Photoshop, but these are the instructions. Lightroom is easy because it's right there on the, on the develop module. Photoshop, you have to go to view uh, slash proof setup slash custom slash CMYK uh, working space, and then toggle, you can toggle between the two rendering entrants there. So if you use Photoshop, that's, that's how you do it. But anyway, this is another picture. This is a picture I did uh, of Waterloo Village, and I really liked the yellows in it, but I couldn't get it to print the yellows. I just couldn't. It didn't matter what I did. And uh, I, I, I checked the, I checked the, the um, soft proof, and all those yellows were out of gamut. And it didn't matter what I did. I could not get it to print the yellows. It just, it, it, it came close, but it just didn't quite get there. Some, and if you look, if you remember when I showed you those uh, color spaces, there were colors that weren't in those those color spaces, and um, the the printer was pushing everything together to make it work, but missed something in there. Huh? No, I, I I mean I, it was just for a camera club company. I shouldn't say just for a camera club, but it was just for the camera club. Company. But in that situation, you wanted to push something else to be sent. Would I send it out? I don't. You know, that's a good question. I might. I might. It might be another one we're doing a metal or aluminum might look out better too. For some reason, they have tend to have very vibrant colors. The other thing you have to decide is how you're going to crop it. Are you going to do a standard size? You know, the 11 by 14 or 8 by 10? Or are you going to do, um, this isn't my picture, this is another friend uh, that had me edit her picture for, but, um, and this one, this was the original picture on the, on the left, and I changed the orientation because I thought it fit the flower better, but it still kept it at 11 by 14, so she could use a standard size um, mat. Now, I don't. I, I like to map my pictures the size that looks best for the picture, which means you're going to have to learn to match your own pictures. Don't either that or pay somebody to do it for you, but I'd rather not do that. That's when you can save money, actually, um, is with matting your own pictures. And it's not that hard. And I also do a, I also do a course on that if you want. To. So. Uh, so selecting the resolution uh, for printing. Uh, the interesting thing about resolution, I remember learning many years ago when I was an advertising major in college, is that um, they said you only need to have a resolution of 72. And I just remember this for some reason. I mean, that was 100 years ago, but I still remember that they said you only need a resolution of 72 for a billboard. 
because it's always so far away from who's ever looking at it that, that they're never going to get close enough to see the to the dots. Um, and that, that holds true for printing too. Uh, if it's an eight inch photo, you're probably going to need a higher resolution because people are looking at it up close. If it's a 24 inch photo, it doesn't need to be quite so intense because they're looking at it further away. So when you select, so you need to decide what, what size print you're going to do. And then depending on the number of pixels on each side of that print, you divide it by the resolution that you want. So if it's an eight by 10 and you want a resolution of 240, you divide it by, you divide the pixels on either side uh, by 240 and, and determine whether or not it'll make an eight by 10 or not. If you have more pixels, it'll make a bigger print at 240. If it's uh, if you want a really big print, you can use a little bit less than 240. You might be able to use 180 to get it as big as you want. But that's what you do. You divide the pixels on each side of the print by by whatever the resolution is, whether it's 240 or 300 or 360, and that'll tell you how big a print you can do with it at that resolution. Now, some printers like Canon and Epson have a native resolution, and it doesn't matter what resolution you use, they prefer to use 300. Canon is 300 and 600, and Epson is 360 and 720. So those are the two resolutions you should be using. That's gonna give you a better quality print, but it's also gonna mean you have to have bigger picture files in order to make a bigger print. So um, setting up the printer, uh, going to the printer instructions. I can show you in Lightroom, it's easiest. Where is it? You have to, you just it's it's pretty quick and it's it's pretty much the same with uh, with with Photoshop. Where is the? Okay, you're going to want to set your resolution. In this case, it's 240, but you can just change it if you want. Uh, the print sharpening is usually standard. The media type in this case was, I have it set for glossy. And the media type, when, you, when I showed you those, um, when I showed you those profiles <clears throat> earlier, they all had to tell you what media type, I'm sorry, is in the, what you need for that printer. <clears throat> when I showed them, they all list a media type for that paper. And it's, <clears throat> it'll tell you like semi-gloss, gloss, gloss um, matte, Fine art, <clears throat> fine art one. I've lost my voice. Fine art one, or you know, so you need to put that in here. What the media type is? This is glossy or matte for this. And then um, this is the paper profile here, where you click on it and uh, select select the profile. And then sometimes. I've used this because it, it, the print might come out a little bit darker than I planned. I don't usually use this, but it is handy to help have, have it there if you need it. Then you go into the printer driver, and this is important if you're doing any of this more high-end printing. This is um, you have to spot, This is where you put in the media type. This is where you put in the size and the feed, and all of you have printer drivers that will have similar things. But one of the things you have to do, and I think they've made it easier on the newer printer drivers, is um, is you need to click on the color intensity. You want to stop color matching by the printer. And when you click on color intensity, you get this dialog that comes up and you click on none. That's really important. And other, other printer drivers, wherever it says it's something about color matching, you want it to be none because you don't want the printer getting it's getting involved at all. You want the printer to stay out of it and let the let the computer do the management of it. Okay, so we should be ready to go. I won't go through those. I've already done those. And so that's pretty much it. You've got a great printer. You've got a gazillion, you've got a gazillion print cartridges. You bought a good monitor that has a huge color space. You have regularly calibrated your monitor, so it's perfect. You have selected your paper, downloaded the ICC profile. You've selected your rendering intent and your resolution. And you've gone through the print dialogue and done everything you're supposed to do.
and um, we get friends. And it used to be that I would sort of cross my fingers, but as since I started hooking it up with the USB port, uh, it, it comes out really, really well. And I'm, but if it doesn't, if you see, if you print out, if you print it out big and you see that dust spot in the corner that you didn't see before, or you see, you look at it and say, eh, it's not quite as contra in, as sharp as I wanted it. It's just, you're just going to have to do it again. And that's a nice thing because you can do it again. You can just hit that button, fix it, and do it again. So, no, or now if you're ordering from an outside vendor, all of everything I said above applies. Um, you do need a calibrated monitor. You do need to process the photo and make sure it's because it's, it's the way you want it. You can often, obtain, as I said before, you can obtain a profile from a vendor so that you can soft proof the photo and Lightroom or Photoshop. And um, I recommend that you do a test print at home to see, make sure, mainly for lightness or darkness, to make sure it's coming off the printer the way you're seeing it on the screen. And you'll most likely uh, be sending a high quality JPEG. So what you see on the screen from a color standpoint should be the same as what the color, the printer sees, because JPEGs tend to be fairly consistent with respect to their colors. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's kind of what I was. That's kind of what I was saying by using a JPEG. Okay. Okay. It's because the JPEG is an SRG. Some of the vendors say they will And that's fine. If they'll do that, if they're comfortable doing that, and they're pretty comfortable with the color, that's fine. That's fine. You got a driver from the vendor. You would install it and then you would solve food in Lightroom or Photoshop. Okay. Either one. Either one. And and the soft proofing, the soft proofing enables you to, to you can edit it, you can adjust the colors, do everything. I don't know how for me, I I don't know how well it, it uh, works, but it's probably the best you have with respect. If you can get the profile from the printer, um, then you can get it as close as you possibly can. It should be and if your screen's calibrated, it shouldn't be that far off any. It's just if you have an, if you don't have a calibrated screen, it's just a really good way. Some of the big vendors, though, they have their websites where you put everything up and then you look at it. Like I always, before they close down, they use Costco and they used to give you the profile right there. Right, right. For your particular store. And it was easy because you could send an eight by 10 print and go pick it up in an hour, you know, and see if it was okay. Right, right. So that's, you know, I don't. Would they do it over free? If you, would they, or do they charge you for it if you want to get done? No, it's like it was trivial, like maybe seventy-five cents. Oh, okay. It was very cheap, so it wasn't a big deal. But you can't do that anymore because they closed down. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah. But Bay Photo has their whole, own whole photo editing preparation, the whole thing. But I'm still using Costco a lot. Cool. I just they mail it to me. But I wish they were still here. <laughs> no. It was easier. I don't have to wait eight days to get my proof back. Yeah, I know, isn't it? Well, you could always buy a plan. I mean I don't do my own printing and I haven't really even done many prints, you know, with vendors recently, but Typically, when I edit, I do all my editing in Pro Photo. And again, you know, saving it as a JPEG, I can do it as a Do you know if there's any downside to doing that? Is that how you do it? No, it's um, no, I don't convert it at all. I I stay in Pro Photo, and um, and and that's of course the, see, the printer's right next to me. If it comes out and I'm not happy, I can do it over again. But I don't. I've never noticed the problem because remember your computer screen, even though it has a gazillion colors in it, you're only seeing Adobe RGB probably at the most. You're not seeing your everything that uh, um, Lightroom shows the Pro Photo. You're only seeing Adobe RGB, and that's pretty close to your colors print your printer's color space in most cases. So. Um, you shouldn't see that much difference between the two. Now they say if you use, if you have an SRG, if you put Lightroom on, can, I don't even know if you can put Lightroom on sRGB. I know you can put Photoshop. They say then you're guaranteed that it's going to be the same, but I haven't noticed a difference. So why have you? Have you well, noticed? I 
it took me a while when I was new with photography, but I finally figured out it to do it. the color space. I was leaving it at Pro Photo, and when I would upload it, which obviously was a totally different blogging, but when I, when I would upload it to like Facebook or Instagram, right, like anytime I was looking at it in the browser, basically, the colors were horrible. It was like green, it was just like, couldn't even bear to look at it. Um, and then I finally figured out that I had to change it from Pro Photo to sRGB when I, before I sent huh. it as a JPEG, and that fixed that problem. I wasn't sure though. Well, that's good. That's if, good to know. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't. Uh, I haven't noticed that. Mine. Mine looked on Facebook just like they look on my screen. So I'm not. Must have. Been, I don't know. I don't know why that would be. But what about the big camera profile? You set your camera. Mm -hmm. SRGB, you can do a WRGB. Uh, I would do the broadest one possible. I'm sorry? I would do the biggest one possible. Yeah. Yeah, I would. Why not have all the colors there? I mean, that probably would only apply to JPEG anyway. Yeah. Law, yeah. But, right. Doesn't apply to law. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. I don't do JPEG, so it really doesn't matter. So. Okay, so what the artistic benefits a print can be displayed. I mean, it's really neat to be able to to share something like this with somebody. Uh, it can provide, you know, I, I just love I just love this. I, I like this picture anyway, but um, it's often easier to achieve subtlety in a print than it is in, in on the screen. And that's absolutely true. Um, a display can be more beautiful than a digital photo, and sometimes it isn't more beautiful than a digital photo. It depends on the photo. And printing your work can distinguish you from other photographers. Which gets me to um, some of the things that I do. And I really would like to branch out more in selling things. I just recently, I do these note cards. They're, they're I get them from Red River Paper. They're about, um, you get a hundred of them at a time. And I, and I print those and they have the, I can do the writing on the back and I like envelopes to go with them. And I sell them for about four, Four bucks a piece at farmers markets and the fair and stuff like that. And they really sell well because people want a souvenir or they see something they like or whatever. And um, and I'll leave this out here. The other things I like to sell, these are note cards. They're by Hannah Mueller. Um, I should take it out of here so you can see that. Um, I just love these things. I, I really should, if I wanted to sell more of them, I should sell them with one of those little easels so that people could set it on an easel. But but they they really turn out nice. And um, I, I just think they come in this cool little box. I think I brought the box. Yeah, you can turn off the light. That's good. Yeah, they, they come in this cool little box. And then um, the other thing that I do is whenever I do a test print, if I'm going to do a larger print, I always put my name on the bottom of it. It's just it's just in like them. You can just automatically print it every time I do a test print. And um, I put the I put some heavy paper behind it like this, and then put it in a plastic sleeve, and I sell them for ten bucks a piece. Wow! At the fair, so that means all my test prints get sold. Wow! And these sell. Like crazy, they just do. That's a, that's a good way so, to, to recycle your stuff. It, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that's kind of. I wanted to share that with you. The other thing I do is I do eleven by fourteen maps and sell those. But, but when you're talking about the fair and farmers markets and stuff, people aren't there to spend a lot of money. So this little stuff. And I spent, I sent, I sold over three hundred dollars worth of stuff at the Sussex County Fair this summer nice. of these little things. So. It's kind of cool. Yeah, I, you sign all your bigger prints too, or just general? No, I, I, no, I put my lo the logo on the back of the bigger prints, but I don't do it on the front. And it's just the little ones for sale. And that's sort of the reason I do that is because it tells me that, that um, this is a print that I have printed as a, as a test proof, but I don't remember it. That it's good for sale. So, so that's my stuff. You can take a look at it if you want. These are the different papers and stuff. And uh, here's some websites. Uh, Robert Rodriguez Jr. is um, a photographer up in Beacon, New York. He actually does uh, a printing masterclass workshop, two day workshop. He also has an online printing masterclass that you can buy and watch. Uh, he also has a book. 
And then there's Sean Bagshaw. He just came out with a, 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 a printing class. It's about 28 videos that you can download. Not very expensive. I put my website in here, but I don't have a printing class on it. Sorry. <laughs> and um, the, some books down here. The color management, the fine art printing I mentioned earlier, the color management and quality output. That's way, way too technical. I don't recommend it. I bought it because I thought it'd be cool, but it hasn't answered a single question. It's way over my head. Um, and then um, the digital fine art printing by Robert Rodriguez. You can get it on his website. So, so any other questions? For those of you who print, who, who send your stuff out, any, do you have any other questions? Okay. Can you just send my stuff out? Mm -hmm. So, I miss Costco. <laughs> I have to wait now to get my stuff back. Yeah, I know. Make sure it's okay. That's one of them, yeah. But there's their prints, so all of it's yeah, it's really a nice book. That's one of my favorite papers. And here's also, you can from these places like Kansas, you can buy sample packs, which have all the papers in them. And if you want to look at these, that's fine, you can. Um, they're really kind of cool. Do they come in with different associations? Right? Do they have an expiration? No. They don't? No. I mean, they they're archival. To. They should last forever, they right? Back in the day. Well, not that I'm aware of. So I mean, I think 500 years ago. <laughs> well, I'm talking about back in the day when we were expert in the HP. Do they come in with different associations? They didn't go bad. Could he? Or 